Okay, it looks like we can get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Matt Bach, Assistant Director of uh, Strategic Communications for the Michigan Municipal League, and you've joined uh, Live with the League, our uh, regular conversation with our Lansing team about all things uh, dealing with cities and, and local government and legislation. Uh, today, we got uh, a, a good show. We got uh, Chris Hackbarth is up doing a conference, so he's not with us this afternoon, but uh, we have the rest of the team, uh, Harasana, John, and Jennifer. And of course, uh, Betsy and uh, Kristen are, are always in the background helping us with the technical aspect of things. Uh, we're having a problem connecting with the Facebook stream, so uh, we'll, we will post it on Facebook. Usually it's live on Facebook, but for right now, it's not working. So we'll, we'll post a recording of this conversation then uh, once we get that recording, we'll put it on Facebook. So uh, one of the things off today, uh, we had our, our convention recently, uh, seemed to go really well. We had well over uh, 300 attendees from all over the state. We had a, a live with the league in person, which is we hadn't done in about two years. Uh, that was a, that was pretty fun with, with the team. We had a good, good crowd for that, a lot of good questions. Um, we really uh, focused uh, during convention uh, on the concept of trust and belonging, and that seemed to resonate a lot. John, I know you did a couple sessions uh, kind of around that. Uh, how do you think convention went, and what did some of the feedback you heard from our members about it? Yeah, so personally, uh, I, I thought it went well, but, but more importantly, I think the feedback, at least that I received, and I'll let Harrison and Jen weigh on, weigh in on what they heard, uh, was very positive from our members. First, we were back in person, um, you know, and and I thought we handled that well. And it was a it was a welcome, you know, couple of days to interact and and see people again. Which I know for me, it's been some time before uh, or since I've been able to do that. Um, I can also tell you it was a little strange being up on stage in front of people uh, live, uh, unlike this. Uh, you know, which is a, a little bit more comfortable, you know, considering I'm wearing shorts right now, uh, and not, uh, not jeans like I was during, during convention. Um, but overall, I think the positive uh, feedback from members was, was tremendous, right? And I think they, they truly enjoyed the message that we had, which builds upon our community wealth building message. It builds upon the great work uh, that, that we're doing collectively as a staff and that our members are doing as a whole in, in the face of tough situations. And I think gives us and, and builds on uh, both both hope and optimism uh, as we move forward. So I, I'd love to hear Harrison and Jen's thoughts as well. I mean, I'll chime in and probably echo a lot of what John said, but first of all, I think it was just good to be in community with membership again. I remember, you know, seeing lots of introductions and waves and, you know, meeting people in real life. And I think especially for our members who came into their roles during the pandemic, you know, to find community. And I think that our, our theme for convention on trust and belonging was, you know, very correctly focused on what our members are engaging in right now. And so it's been exciting to see the conversations that have come out of that, you know, meeting new members are very excited about the things that we do with the league and getting them more involved with the association. I think that's one of the really great parts of this as well, too. So you know, looking forward to how we can build up those conversations and keep gathering in the future. I think I was there the least um, amount of time out of our team. So, um, you know, I didn't see a ton, ton of folks, um, but the ones I did see, I very much enjoyed the conversation. Um, it was great to be in person answering questions versus having to shoot off an email or leave a, a voicemail. So, um, I think it was, but yeah, I think it's so pertinent to, you know, a lot of the questions that were raised were about combating false narratives that are out there and how do, you know, we rebuild that trust in, in what your locally elected officials and, and staff are saying um, to, to help um, push, push forward the good things that our members are working on. So I thought it was great and look forward to, you know, more in-person things um, as, as we go on here. Yeah, I, I noticed that after our <clears throat> that one Friday session with the Live with the League <clears throat> panel session that we had, you guys all had long lines of people wanting to talk to you afterwards. And I know, Jen, you were I got a few pictures of you taking rigorous notes from people <laughs> that we're talking about. So I know it's always great to see people and hear the feedback they have. Uh, one of the things that, that, that we talked about at that session and also that our members had a question about was the budget. Um, so the state budget got approved. Uh, 
I believe in the House and Senate while we were at convention and got signed by the governor um, the following uh, week, I believe it was last week. Um, days all kind of blend together. <clears throat> but um, I know that uh, Chris Hackbarth, uh, who I said, you know, is not going to be with us today because he's at a conference. He posted a very long blog detailing a lot of the budget stuff that was in there. You can find that blog on Inside 208. I'd encourage you to check that out. But John and, and team, if you guys could kind of break it down for us, it seemed like overall it was a pretty good outlook for our communities. Yeah. Um, you know, it, and I'll say this again because we've talked about it before. It, it was a strange budget cycle for you know all the reasons that uh, you know we've had to sit at home and advocate in different ways uh, for our members. Uh, but it also was a budget cycle that that has and quite frankly will continue to over the next few months uh, provide tremendous opportunity for investment, uh, both within our communities. Uh, you know, within our, our business sectors uh, as it relates to economic development, housing, and a variety of other things. Uh, and this budget really showed that. At, at the base level, you know, we always talk about revenue sharing. Um, and we saw what, what we've seen to be pretty typical over the last, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, uh, where we didn't, we didn't get any cuts per se. Uh, we did build in a 2% increase into the base, which represented about 5.2 million. Although there was another additional line item in there of 433,000 for the roughly 100 communities uh, that could not uh, uh, take advantage of the CARES Act funding that, that came in at the end of the last fiscal year. And, and just as a, as a reminder, what had happened is the state had actually cut the revenue sharing payment uh, for the last month of the, the last fiscal year and in replacement added federal funds. Now those federal funds were not able to be utilized by every community, so therefore they had to send them back and it really effectively was a cut for them. Uh, so the state, this uh, fiscal year for this next fiscal year's budget has included a one-time $433,000 payment to keep those roughly 100 communities whole. Um, you know, so it, 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 it at least speaks to the consistency of which they were trying to achieve and ultimately at the end of the day, we're able to get there. But there was also a, a tremendous amount of good, particularly on the environment side. And I'll let Harrisana talk about that a little bit and some of the, the things that we saw over there. Thanks, John. Yes. Yeah, so we were really excited to see uh, small one-time grants for high waters and shoreline erosion funded at 14.3 million. So we'll be definitely looking for ARP funding to supplement the support of that. But in addition, that's something that we're really excited to see finally um, placed into the budget. There also was 45 million put into emergency disaster response and mitigation, which is twofold benefit for us. One for the recent flooding that we've seen around for different systems, retaining our systems, repairs, and also some proactive remediation, but also when we start looking to ongoing effects of shoreline and coastal effects, being able to be resilient in those areas too. Um, and then, John, am I missing one more on, on bridges? Ooh, no, I, I can come back and circle bridges, but do you want to talk about cybersecurity quick? I do want to talk about cybersecurity. And so going back, you know, throughout the year, we've been having conversations about the importance of resiliency and cybersecurity in all of our systems from, you know, the heart of municipal operations to our utilities to election security. Um, and so we saw in the budget for a first time, $20 million that'll be invested in reinforcing systems. Um, so we'll likely see a lot of that uh, funding go to the state level, but again, having a, a secure state system benefits us at the local government level as well. Um, and then we're also hearing from the department as well, they're looking for an appropriation of that portion to go to local support and to continue supporting programs like IC3, the Michigan Cyber Civilian Corps, which is a direct resource to our local governments as well. One interesting thing I thought with the budget was, um, and Chris addressed it in his blog, which Betsy posted the link to the blog in the chat. So thank you for doing that, Betsy, was the issue of mask mandates. And it's like, we're talking about budget and all of a sudden now this the mask mandates gets in there. It seems like a weird thing to have in there. And, and it's kind of, uh, kind of caused some confusion among um, some of our locals. John, what are you hearing on that? And what's the latest on that part of it? Yeah, so there's really two components here. Um, there's a, a mass mandate component and there's a vaccine mandate component. Um, how or why these things get into the budget at some point, um, you know, not, not for us to speculate. You know, there's a lot of negotiation that goes on behind the scenes and the way things happen. And 
you know, sometimes, you know, we're not fully aware and, and, you know, many others aren't fully aware and you get strange and quirky things that show up. And I think I would put that under this category right now, but on the mass mandate front, uh, at the end of the day, in the governor's budget uh, letter that she issued when signing it, she deemed that unenforceable. So there, there is still the ability at the local level to, to have mass mandates. So if that's, you know, the county health department that, that's doing those types of things, that's still fully allowable. The other issue, though, becomes really with vaccine mandates, which in this case, it does not ban. Uh, well, I, 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 should, I shouldn't say it like that because this is needs to be very carefully worded so I don't make it more confusing than what it al already is. Um, so th the issue here is that you should not have a, a vaccine mandate, right? As it, but you could encourage vaccines or have it done as long as it comes along with a testing aspect, okay? So you have to have that secondary component of testing along with it. Now the issue becomes, and, and we've talked to some communities about this, is cost. Um, so it's really consistent with the way other things have gone, but if a community is gonna come in and say, hey, you either need to be vaccinated or you need to go through a daily or weekly test, you know, depending on the particular time frame, uh, that can become very expensive for a community to, to, to run. So in that case, while we don't outright say you can't have a, a vaccine mandate, uh, we couple that with a testing component, but the reality of it is that it becomes very difficult to do and therefore could subject some of your potential funding, um, you know, to being withheld as a result of, of that. So I know we're still navigating our way through it. We've raised some questions and concerns both with the administration and with the legislature, because I think what we do see sometimes, while, while maybe they may be well-intentioned in terms of trying to provide flexibility, what they do in reality is is add additional cost burdens and confusions, uh, both for us as we try to navigate our way through it uh, on, a, on a staff level, but for our communities who have to deal directly with the immediate impacts of it. So I would stay tuned for a little bit more on that as we continue to get some additional information and see if there's gonna be any clarity provided to that either out of the administration or by the legislature itself. Thanks, John. And we do have a question from uh, Josh uh, uh, in Granville, one of our new board members. Congratulations, Josh, on being appointed to our board during our convention. Um, why did the governor not line item veto that part of the budget if unenforceable? And did she veto other parts? Yeah, so I, I mean, from, from that standpoint, I don't, and I'll be honest, I don't have the list of all the vetoes uh, sitting here in front of me right now, mainly because we were paying closer attention to those things that directly uh, impact us, which we did not see any vetoes in, in relation to that. Um, but on the unenforceable uh, standpoint, what I will tell you, the, the indication that we got is that through the budget negotiation that that language uh, was gonna be in there uh, and that there was an agreement that the mass mandate would be ruled unenforceable, but she would not uh, have that same ruling on the vaccine component of it and therefore did not issue uh, an unenforceable statement in relation to her letter that she issued when signing the budget. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, one of the uh, things that you mentioned already was the revenue sharing component, the 2%, and that came up during our session at convention too. We're always appreciative whenever we get a we get a percentage increase, but I do know that some of the members at the at least at that uh, convention were like, "Well, why is it only two percent when the state has so much money from ARP resources and other things?" Um, and what's your answer to that, Jen? <laughs> well, so again, uh, as we deal with uh, billions sitting on the table, um, it, it is sometimes hard to question, like, "Hey, why aren't we putting more in one place versus another?" Or, you know, what are you doing with that money? What I can tell you very directly about the money that, that has been spent uh, and also the money that is available is that the money that's been spent was really a baseline budget. There were a few things in there that, that drew down on some American Rescue Plan dollars from the state and fiscal component of it. There was a few uh, dollars in terms of excess GF that was available that was put into this budget. But by and large, it was very much a baseline budget as it relates to the previous fiscal year. All that being said, there's still lots of money left on the table. So what we know, um, and I'll try not to get two numbers heavy here, but with Hackbar uh, not on today, somebody's got to fill that role. So uh, at um, 
and about 6.5 billion that was coming into the state for for state and local fiscal relief funds on the American Rescue Plan. The state spent about 800 million, uh, roughly, and given it about 5.7. 5.75 or so uh, billion left in which to spend. Uh, the state also had about 3.5 billion in excess GF available. And of that, they spent about $700,000 roughly. So that means, you know, collectively we, we have still uh, in, in the pot, um, you know, about $8 billion or so, eight and a half billion dollars of, of revenue yet to be spent. What we understand to be, uh, the trajectory here is that they will get to work to spending those. They will utilize uh, the budget process uh, to do that through what's called a supplemental uh, appropriation. Um, and those will likely take place uh, over the next two to three months. I think the goal, based on what the administration would like to see happen and what the, uh, what the legislature would like to see happen, is to have those dollars and the majority of those dollars obligated by the end of this year uh, from a calendar standpoint. And John, could you talk a little bit about our work in that area? Because, you know, we do kn did know this money was out there. We have had many ideas about how this money should be spent. We have been working with the governor's administration and with lawmakers to try to get our priorities uh, passed along. What are some of the work you're doing in that area so that our members know? <laughs> yeah, well, there's no question we have ideas. Um, and, uh, but, you know, so, so do a lot of other people. And, and that's really... Um, what we were trying to take advantage of is the fact that there are multiple people out there that have uh, thoughts and, and, and needs, quite frankly, as it relates to the, the dollars that are available. So we have been in the process and we have notified both the, the, the governor and the state budget office and legislative leaders uh, that we would be working to bring together a coalition of organizations to talk about the American Rescue Plan very directly. Um, what we've seen from a public uh, rollout in terms of proposals, both from the legislature and from the administration, is a very, what we refer to as a siloed approach. So it's it's one proposal at a time that might deal with economic development, it might deal with water and sewer, state or local parks, um, you name it, on down the line. But what we haven't seen is really a comprehensive effort to say, here is how you could spend the remaining available resources, uh, and let's have a conversation from there which is really what we are doing right now. That work is, is really coming to a close. We talked about it at convention here uh, you know, a week and a half ago, uh, but as that work comes to a close uh, over the next seven to 10 days, we will once again be communicating with the administration and the legislature uh, to provide the, the group think uh, of that coalition. And then shortly after that, we'll have a much more public uh, outreach as it relates to that proposal. Um, and we really feel as if we have a, in, an excellent opportunity to make headway uh, and influence the way in which these dollars are invested uh, based on, on both the people that we have at the table, but those that we've also tried to recognize within that proposal that may not have, have had a direct seat for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we really think of it as a, as a well-balanced, well-rounded proposal uh, in some very key areas as, as we move forward. And, and kind of related to that uh, is the fact that there's a misunderstanding or misperception, conception, I guess, of uh, where our communities at are financially uh, because of the CARES Act money and the ARP money. There's, a, I think, some lawmakers think that we're somehow flush with cash. And yeah. that's something that you guys are kind of battling, isn't it, John? Just kind of to try to correct that. Yeah, you know, um, battling is one word. I, I think sometimes as, as, as this comes into play, what you really just need to, to, to do is educate. Um, so there's, there's nothing uh, wrong with what's happening. I just think there's so much information out there as it relates to ARP and all the different things that are going on uh, that it is our role as, as advocates for our members to, to make sure that we have and can provide a deeper understanding, which is really what's needed here. So on the surface, there's no question, $4.4 .4 billion in the local government is a lot of money. Um, but when, when spread out over the 1,800 plus local units that we have, and the way in which our non-entitlement uh, communities get funding on a per capita basis. You know, we have, I, I think the, the statistic we referenced at convention was 82% of uh, local units of government or, or non-entitlement local units of government, which there are 1,724, 82% of them are getting less than $500,000. And while still that money can make a substantial difference in, in those communities, the way in which we utilize, you know, that 500,000 to turn it into a million or 5 million 
is to partner with the state and, and others to ensure that we can leverage and then amplify those resources. Uh, so while we may not have a lot of money to do significant matches, we do have some money, um, but it is not going to be enough by itself uh, to make the types of differences and changes that we want to see, which is why the state's role in this uh, in our collective efforts as an organization with the coalition is going to be critically important. Yeah, and we talked about that. That Chris Hackbarth was quoted in a, a USA Today article about that that fact that a lot of communities aren't getting a whole lot, particularly when you spread it over two years. You mentioned the five hundred thousand. I think you know, depending on what kind of size fire truck you get, that could be like one fire truck is what that could be. But and but um, might be a so used Chris, fire truck too. And right, <laughs> so it's not a whole lot of money. But Chris is quote in the article was about trying to pool the resources like the counties have money some cities have money and you look at this in a regional approach and that is one of the the things that we're trying to encourage our members to do as an app uh, th there's there's no question um which is why we've encouraged our members to be patient uh when they think about how they spend these resources and also very intentional about how they go about doing it too and making sure that they're having engaged conversations with with their residents and community leaders but also talking to the county um, but it is also imperative that they wait uh, as, as long as they're able to uh, see what the state does, right? Because the state's ability to, to continue to spend their available resources, which I had mentioned is still almost $5.8 billion, is going to in, ensure or hopefully ensure that there are other opportunities in which for locals to leverage those funds uh, against those state resources. And as I had said, amplify them uh, so you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, and that's going to be really critical as it comes to doing something as necessary and needed as a water and sewer project. Or maybe it just gets down to creating the pocket park and doing some creative placemaking in your community, all of which likely will be able to be more successful. And I, and I know I'm going to help you make a transition here for a second, Matt, because I know in the budget, one thing we didn't mention is something that, that Jen's been really engaged in on. Uh, is is some of the community revitalization aspect and you know some of the the positives that are out there uh, with with some dollars in the budget. So Jen, maybe you want to just talk about that for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So there was a uh, hundred million. Well, I should say CRP, the Community Revitalization Program, and BDP, the Business Development Program. Um, that that was funded um, same as fiscal year last last fiscal year at 100 million. Um, there was a new one-time appropriation for rural jobs and capital investment fund at 5 million, as well as a one-time appropriation for um, what I think John's referring to, the community revitalization and placemaking uh, grants. And that's really to allow for um, funding around, say, social districts, um, public spaces, um, and, and trying to, to upkeep possibly outdoor retail, um, anything with, you know, outdoor, getting folks outdoors, community places, um, and creating that space. Um, and, and according to the MEDC, when I um, checked, you know, they're, they still need to have discussions exactly how that uh, programming will, will roll out, but we're very excited to get that $100 million. Thank you, Jen. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, one was from uh, Clive Robinson, going back to the vaccine mandate that we talked about. So the vaccine mandate discussion is a recognition that the proposed Biden vaccination rules are not ap applicable to municipalities. Is that, that's a question there. Is that true or? Yeah, so, so Clyde, just a, maybe a touch outside of my wheelhouse to, to ensure I can provide you an exact answer. So I'm not going to uh, step in it on that issue any more than, than maybe I already have. But I think what we can do is make sure that, you know, from our end, that we'll work with Chris Johnson to get back to you directly uh, on that specific thing. And then I'm sure as as we have some additional clarity, we'll get some uh, very specific details out to the membership as a whole. Okay. And then there was a question about explaining what uh, non-entitlement local units of government are versus entitled units of governments. We, we sometimes get caught up on acronyms. So we talk about NEUs and non-NEUs and all that stuff. So John, can you briefly explain what those are? Uh, well, yes, simplest form. Um, so if we think about entitlement units, by and large, there are communities that are 50,000 and greater. Uh, and can receive or, or, or do typically receive direct allocation from the federal government, specifically as it relates, relates to community development block grants. 
and NEUs, uh, and there's only 49 of those, uh, to be honest, in the, in, in the state. NEUs is every other city, village, and township that is left. So typically those that are under 50,000 and don't get that direct allocation, and there are 1,724 of those. Okay, great. And then another question about the budget, is there any fund for public library physical upgrades statewide? Is there anything with libraries in the budget that you saw? Uh, not, not that I saw in there. I did not look uh, for the library line item directly, I'll be honest, but I, I do not believe um, that there was anything in there specifically for physical upgrades to libraries. And Jen or Harrison, you might know uh, slightly more than me. Okay. All right. I see them shaking their heads. So <laughs> that's not our, not our wheelhouse so much of libraries, but um, I did want to add, talk to you a little bit, Jen, about some of the uh, uh, marijuana caregiver bills that are out there. Now you've been working on that issue. So hop off the budget here for a minute and tell us a little bit about that. Sure. About two weeks ago, there were three bills introduced, um, House Bill 5300, um, 5301, and 5302. Um, that are actually going to be in House Reg Reform tomorrow in committee um, for hearings and testimony only. Um, but these are bills to help uh, look at regulating caregivers um, since they operate outside of the commercial market. Um, so the biggest change is that a caregiver would be defined as an individual with one patient. Um, if you had uh, more than one patient, you up to five, you would be required to get a special, a special medical grower's license. Um, and you know, the reason the league has gotten involved in um, these bills and, and working on these is because one of the number one complaints we hear is about um, growth in residential um, areas and not being able to do anything about it. Um, these bills would require that anyone with the, the specialty medical growers license, so again, a caregiver with more than one patient, um, would have to be out in uh, industrial or ag zoned type districts. It also would require that the locals are opting in to allow that. Um, so we see this as uh, assisting to um, get those unregulated caregivers out of um, neighborhoods um, for communities who, who choose to do go that way. Um, but then there's a lot of, um, I would say, uh, safety and accountability standards where um, if you are licensed as a specialty medical grower, you would have to now go through the testing uh, and labeling as the other uh, grows have to, the other commercial frameworks. Um, it also would prohibit the sale of overages for un- um, licensed medical growers. So basically, if you don't have that, that specialty medical grow as a caregiver, you would not be able to legally sell your overages. Um, so they think that that it would also allow for the revoking of specialty medical grow licenses if someone's not in um, compliance. And they would be required to um, register with um, the marijuana regulatory agency and then that information would be available to municipalities as well as caregivers it would require even a caregiver with one patient um, to provide their information to the agency and again um, locals would have access to knowing where those grows uh, where those caregivers are as well as those um, specialty medical growers would be going forward and Jen, can you address the one question for you? It looks like if your neighbor grows in his or her backyard, what are the general rules regarding screening or et cetera? So um, unfortunately we can't regulate um, being a good neighbor, but if, if your neighbor is you know, 21 or older, um, they would fall under the adult use um, and, and they're able to, to grow that. I believe it has to be secured so somebody can't you know, reach over the fence and, and you know, cut it or grab it, um, but you would have to um, speak with uh, your locally elected or local police department on that. Um, but just growing um, and smelling it, uh, there's really not a whole lot can do as long as they're um, within the legal plant count. And again, they're over 21, 21 or over. 
I think there's another question here for you. It says, will these bills need a super majority of votes to pass them? Um, I think it's because it was a ballot issue that they might think they need a, a, a greater group to, to, over, to do that. Yes, and I will say the, the bills are um, sponsored by partisan sponsorship. So um, you have both sides of the aisle engaging um, on this issue and really looking at it from a health and safety aspect um, mm -hmm. and, and making sure that the product that's getting out to patients uh, has been tested um, and packaged securely. Um, so I, yes, it does need that, but so far um, it seems to have you know, bipartisan support, not a ton of pushback. Okay. All right. Um, we did have a couple <clears throat> other questions going back to some of the other stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. We talked. Can you hear me? <clears throat> oh, you shook your head. You're shaking your head. Oh, yeah. are there bills? The, corresponding I, see, Senate I saw that. Are there corresponding Senate oh. bills? And at this time, no, there's not. Okay. Uh, John, the question, one of the questions came through again the, on the NEUs. Can you change your status from an NEU to a to a, a, a well, non entitlement unit to an entitlement unit? Is there a way to change that? For the purposes of the American Rescue Plan, there is not. Uh, as we start to get beyond that thought process and we think about what the federal government does more directly, uh, I, I, I don't know that there is an exact process to, to sort of, you know, uh, change your, your you know, the, what, what category you fall into. The one thing I don't know, uh, though, is how the census overall may, may impact that. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, if we understand that the, the typical cutoff is 50,000 in population, if you happen to be at 49 in the last census, you're at, you know, 52,000 in this sense, the census, does that change something? It may, um, but I, I don't know that direct offhand. Jen, I know obviously your work with, uh, with MEDC, you may have a, a little bit different understanding of that than what I do. So I'll, I'll see if you know more. I don't. Uh, we can check and follow up on that and see if, if there's something to share. Um, but at this time, I don't. I don't have any additional information. OK. Um, one other question uh, that came across was uh, regarding the census. Are the 2020 census results available for all Michigan municipalities? I have seen numbers from cities. So, John, do you know the answer to that? Yeah, I, to the best of my recollection, they are. It's been a, a couple of months since we dealt with that. So forgive my, my memory there, but I, I believe they are. And I, I, I think if we have some time, maybe Betsy can quick search that and post that into the chat. If not, we can make sure we get that back out to the group. Okay. In a timely fashion. All right. I did want to talk to Harrison a little bit more about um, some of the stuff you're working on. You had a group of members in uh, Lan Lansing last week testifying uh, on some bills uh, from Harper Woods. Tell us a little bit about that and what kind of impact this could have on our members. Yeah, Matt. So you're correct. We had officials from the city of Harper Woods join us last Wednesday in Lansing for House Local Government Committee. So we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but as a result of the census, we have several communities who had you know, population growth, which is a huge benefit and a great thing. Um, but for some of our communities that utilize PA 33 as a special assessment to support police and fire, if their population exceeds 15,000, then they are no longer eligible to utilize that special assessment. So in the case specifically of Harper Woods, they levy a certain amount that supports police and fire services. And because of the recent census, they risk, are at risk of no longer being able to do so, which can cause significant impacts to their municipal services across the city. So we have been working uh, the league with uh, Chair Julie Calley over in House Local Government to you know, share this circumstance that's going on. There is a bill from Representative Garza, House Bill 4281, which appeared in committee earlier this year ahead of the census results coming out, um, but it did address this specific issue and in detail to the city of Romulus, which they are a city that cannot utilize PA 33, but they also are the home of Detroit Metro Airport. So with the tax revenue that they gain from their residents, it is nowhere near what they need to support the operations uh, and the 24 hour services needed at, at the Metro Airport. So again, another 
way how PA33 can be utilized as a really helpful to, tool to communities. Uh, and so with Representative Garza along with the city of Harper Woods, we were able to illustrate that uh, in a follow-up committee hearing on Wednesday where we brought forward the bill again. Um, there was a substitute that was adopted so that the city of Romulus could also be included in this adjustment as well. Uh, and there also is another bill from Representative Steenlin which eliminates the population threshold altogether and would put cities on the same playing field as townships, which don't have a population threshold requirement to utilize PA33. So they are able to utilize it regardless of population size. Uh, and so really looking at ways that we can utilize the tools available to us, especially um, looking at the revenue sharing cuts that have happened to communities as a whole. Uh, the committee hearing went great. We didn't hear any opposition. And so we are looking forward to continuing conversations to make sure that we have the language you know, correct and most appropriate for the situation of Harper Woods to correct it quickly. And then hopefully having ongoing conversations about how more municipalities can utilize PA 33. And that's uh, Public Act 33. And that's the, the act that regulates the, this issue that you're talking about. Okay. Um, did get a question, Jen, related for you uh, regarding the marijuana issue. Any legislation to ban marijuana billboard advertising, much like liquor, liquor and tobacco products are banned? Have you seen anything on that? No, not at this time. I haven't um, heard any discussions on that. Okay. All right. I haven't, I'm sure there's, yeah, I, you drive down the expressway 69 or, or whatever, and you see all the signs popping up for all the different uh, dispensaries that are out there now. Um, and uh, Jen, I did want to ask you quickly, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, communities are we, under the Open Meetings Act, there is a, a sunset coming up. Can you talk a little bit about that, how it relates to being able to meet virtually or not, and, and it, as it pertains to your local health department declaring emergencies and the impact that has? I know that's a, an issue that our members have been following pretty closely. Yeah, so at the end of this year, on December 31st, 2021, um, the local uh, declaration of emergencies kind of um, part of the open meeting back um, expires. So at that time, anyone who has declared a local uh, emergency to be able to meet virtually, um, it will expire. And at this time is, is not going to be extended. Um, there have been uh, a few bills um, that have made it through the process or it are in process that are kind of making exceptions for certain public bodies like the Beef Growers Association and the green, the bean growers. Um, and so, you know, we have been trying to talk um, with legislators and those sponsoring bills to try to include all um, public bodies that are appointed um, or don't have uh, necessarily uh, decision-making abilities like the governing body. Um, I will tell you there's still from neither side of the aisle any appetite to allow locally elected officials to participate in, in meetings virtually. Um, and unfortunately until, you know, we were hoping that if we can get uh, appointed uh, elected or appointed public bodies, the ability to do it, we could show after a bit of time, it's, it's not a scary thing. There's not all these crazy, you know, uh, things occurring because people are in front of a screen versus uh, physically at a meeting. Um, but we're just, we're not there yet. So we'll continue to work towards that. Um, but things do revert, um, again, at December 31st, 2021, um, to where you, I think there's the military exemption. And then there is a bill that was either just introduced or will be introduced this week um, that uh, we saw a draft on that's trying to uh, at least take it back to um, the, what it was previous to COVID where someone could participate in the conversations uh, but could not vote. Um, you know, we, we understand the reasoning behind that, but we want to make sure if they're going to go back to that, that we'd like to see the, the same language that was used previously. Um, so that, that's the latest with OMA. That's where we're at right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I know we do have two questions uh, related to the American uh, Rescue Plan Act. Um, uh, one is, is there, are there any trainings as, or as far as things coming up? And I'm going to post in our uh, chat right now that there are a number of trainings that we have posted on our calendar. Some of them are ours. Most of them are other organizations. 
So um, I'm posting that link right there that to our event calendar, you can find all those trainings. And then John, there was a question regarding, um, uh, see, will local non-entitled units of government see additional local road funding? If so, to what degree uh, and, and amount? Yeah, so I so one, let me go back to the uh, events and training question just real quick, Matt, because there's, I think there's, there's three critical things here. And, and one, uh, I believe they are up on our events calendar. So uh, MSU Extension and the Michigan Association of Regions uh, have partnered together to do a variety of both in-person and virtual events across the state. Uh, they started doing that, uh, I think about a week and a half ago, and they're gonna continue those things through uh, just about the end of October. I think October 28th is the last date that they have for training and they'll cover a variety of, of topics. The other thing is, is what we're doing uh, directly with Serve My City uh, and, and what can be uh, done and, and made available as it relates to ARP through the resources that we're providing. So I would encourage everybody to check that out and I'm sure we'll put that in the link. And then the, the final piece is um, what we've, we've done and partnered with the National League of Cities on, which is the Great Lakes Navigator Program, which we talked about extensively at convention and have mentioned here before. But what that is, is a free opportunity and truly a free opportunity to work with the National League of Cities where they will help uh, do a data-driven process uh, with you and with your community to match up your needs with available American Rescue Plan grants that are available outside of any direct funding that the state got or that you received as local units. So there's actually about... $350 billion of available grants out there. I mean, we tend to forget that this was a $1.9 trillion package. Um, yeah. And so what, what the National League of Cities can do is if you go in and you sign up for the Great Lakes Navigator program, uh, they will be able to work with you. They, they've been very fortunate to have some great funding partners from the foundation level nationally uh, in which to make this happen. Uh, but I can't you know, overstate uh, how tremendous of an opportunity this is to have access to uh, real experts in the field and have them help you with everything from that data-driven data analysis to actually completing the grant applications and bringing those to fruition. So I think those are the three things I want to highlight on, on the education front. Uh, to the direct question as it relates to, to road funding, so one is it, is it is specific to ARP, typically that money is not available for, for roads. Um, now, again, there's two aspects of this state dollars, local dollars. If, if you're on the local side, can you spend it in conjunction with on roads in conjunction with a water and sewer project? Yes, you can. Can you do that and spend it on roads if it works into your revenue loss calculation? Yes, you can. Uh, the state dollars, though, are not intended to be spent on roads, although infrastructure is an allowable category. So, again, still sticking with water, sewer, stormwater infrastructure. That all being said, in the budget, and this is where, you know, when, when we think about having excess funds, both federal and state resources, where they can be a little creative. So in the budget, there are a couple of things. One, there is an increase um, in transportation revenue, which is the final phase in of the transportation funding package that passed back in 2015. That's about $52 million. There's $100 million in there. Uh, for local bridges. Uh, so there is a, a very specific list. So it's not a grant process. It's 100 bridges across the state that MDOT, based on data collection through the, the Michigan Transportation Asset Management Council and deemed the 100 most critical bridges really needed to be fixed in the state. The good news is, is there's a, a huge emphasis on that uh, within both the legislature and the administration. So I would anticipate additional funds coming as a result of that. Um, so while maybe not some direct allocations as it relates to roads uh, from, from the Federal American Rescue Plan, there are dollars going into it and there are also more that we anticipate. Uh, so with that, I'll use that as a, a quick transition, Matt, to talk federal issues, which we haven't touched on here, but are incredibly important and quite fluid at this moment. Um, <laughs> and so I, I wrote this down to make sure I kind of can piece this all together because uh, because it is it is interesting because there's a couple of things that are out there. There's the debt limit they're trying to deal with. There's the reconciliation process. 
there's a continuing resolution just to keep government functioning and, and funded. And then there's the, the transportation uh, and infrastructure package that, that's out there. So one, the, the, the Congress did pass a continuing resolution that's gonna extend funding for the federal government to December 3rd. Uh, the transportation uh, and infrastructure package they were trying to vote on last week. They didn't get there. Speaker Pelosi has now extended the self-imposed deadline to October 31st, which really runs with uh, some continued and short-term funding for transportation in this country uh, that also will, will now expire on October 31st. And then you have uh, the debt limit, uh, which we are set to exceed on October 18th. Uh, and that is a huge fight to ensure we don't default on any of our loan payments. And finally, then there's the reconciliation process, uh, which if you listen to, to particularly in the Democrats who control both uh, the Senate and the House, um, you know, one side wants about 3.5 billion in the reconciliation, others want about 1.5, but at this point, what's $2 billion amongst friends? Can't we just get this figured out? Uh, and that, that kind of wraps up a whole heck of a lot that's going on at the, at the federal level in about two minutes. Um, yeah. The only other thing I'd mention, Matt, as I continue to ramble for a second, but what may be most important and most pertinent to our members in the immediate term relates to ARP and the reporting that's associated with it. And so there was an October 31st reporting deadline uh, as a result of receiving those funds just last week. Uh, the feds decided to push that deadline back. So again, if you're an entitlement community, one of those 49, uh, you now have had your deadline pushed back from October 31st to January 31st of 2022. And if you're you know, one of the 1,724 non-entitlement units, you went from October 31st back to April 30th of 2022. So that should provide you a significant time now to, again, further educate yourself you know, make some of those decisions we've asked you to be patient meeting with and, and still be able to meet your uh, your deadline for reporting uh, as those come up here in the future. And they have to report even if they haven't started spending the money yet? They still have to do some well, kind of Well, I, I, you know, again, I, because things tend to be fluid, I, would have that been the case had they not extend the, the deadline? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. But now with the deadline extension and some additional guidance to come back out around that, uh, you know, we'll know more uh, in, the, in the near future. But that also doesn't mean that they might not extend that deadline further, depending on what takes place. And so, um, again, as we talk about the gravity of what's going on here and, and just the sheer size and scope, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, we'll do our best to keep them. And again, our, our, the programs that we mentioned, Serve My City and the Nav NLC's navigation program can help you, though, with those filing deadlines. If you're having issues figuring out what you got to do, those programs can help yeah. and they're free. Yeah, particularly our Serve My City program, yes. Yeah, okay, great. Well, that's all I had on my list. Um, uh, if there's any other questions, uh, we can uh, try to address them after the fact. Uh, um, but uh, I do want to remind people that our next Live with the League a conversation is scheduled for October 18th at noon. Um, we do have a uh, uh, another, uh, we have, like I said, on our calendar, a bunch of different trainings coming up related to American Rescue Plan Act. Um, on November 18th and 19th, we're having a, an institute for our Michigan Mayor's Association. That's going to be in Mount Pleasant. That's a, an event that's coming up in November for our mayors out there. Uh, it's for members and non-members of MAM. I think it's pretty uh, minimal fee to become a member. And there is a discount, I believe, if you're a member of MAM to apply for that. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, until next time, uh, we appreciate you being here.